Om Jnana Timirandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Anecdotes There was uh, once a rather cantankerous old lady who used to cook at one of the nuts for the devotees. No, no, cantankerous. <coughs> that is a somewhat ill-tempered Difficult to get along with, quarrelsome. <coughs> so, she you know, as old people usually do not <laughs> And uh, shortly after that, uh, some of the robbers at the mat were talking about her. And they were all recalling all the different fights they had with her. Then uh, Sasha Taco happened to walk in the room and they were talking about her. And said, well, don't you also remember how she used to cook for you every day? How she uh, very beautifully performed and affectionately performed that service? And they all fell silent. There was uh, at Qatar, of course, many of these stories I'm telling you are from Qatar, the city in Yusuf. Um, because mm-hmm. Jockey Shekhar was from Qatar and he joined the Magda and he, he had many remembrances from that. Mm-hmm. So the branch of the Gorya Magda is called Satchina Mundana. I'm just moving this on onion so the Magda doesn't put her feet on it. It's also part of the Lord's paraphernalia, so actually we should not put our feet in there, it's like on the floor. So, um, yeah, that's called the Satchidananda Mantra. Uh, Bhakti Sumsa for Thakur named this after Satchidananda Thakur Bhakti Mantra. No. Satchidananda was another name for Thakur Bhakti Mantra. Bhakti Mantra Thakur had been a teacher for some time in Kata. Although when the Mantra was established there, he had quite some time before passed away. So anyway, um, the how it started was that first of all, the devotees, they had a a rented house in Kata. They started their preaching activities in there. It's like that in this one also, we see throughout the world. Usually the devotees, they rent a building and they use it for some time, and then the activities expand, they get their own temple, their own building. So in the beginning in uh, Kata, they were worshipping the deities in a rented house, which is actually quite untraditional. Because although householders would, would worship their deities at home, um, brahmacharis, they wouldn't rent a house. It was just unheard of. But uh, Bhakti Sankaswata did many unheard of things for the sake of preaching. Uh, so what happened, there was a... Uh, there was one Chintamani Babu, one betel nut merchant of Qatar, and uh, he had a deity, Shalagam Shiva. And this Shiva was uh, quite famous for fulfilling people's desires. So uh, one time he had a dream that uh, he should give this deity to put this down so now at the same time there was one lady in Qatar who, who uh, had some land, a nice piece of land near the city center. And she also had a dream that she should give this land to a sadhu, that she didn't a good sadhu to give it to. So she wrote the names of different sadhus on a piece of paper and put it in a bag and had her daughter, local sadhus, and had her daughter pull out you know, the name. So the name came out of San Pakistan Saraswati. So uh, without any endeavor on his part, Siddhanta Saraswati had land uh, in in Qatar. And Chintamani Babu, Chintamani Nayak, he, he also donated to build the temple. But Saraswati Thakur was so little displeased because the, the land is a nice location on an important road. But on, along the main road, there were all different shops. So he wasn't very pleased that, that the entrance to the temple. The people were not able to see the temple because it was blocked by the shops. 
So the shops they actually belong to Chintan and Babu. So he uh, he got the shopkeepers to move out and gave that land also and they demolished the shops and then they made a wall and uh, it was nicely situated at the temple. He made a nice temple and the, the deities of Radha, Krishna, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Saul. And that Shalagam Shiva is also worshipped. And uh, there's the they have the printing press there for printing audio books. Now uh, when Bhakti Sansasri Thakur opened the press, he gave a lecture inside the press room. Yeah. And he said that this uh, printing press it is a practice, it is transcendental, just as the deity is transcendental. He said that the printing press is not any less important than the printing press and the production of books is not any less important than the worship of the deity. So he, he deliberately played this, it's very coarsely, I mean, just a two minutes walk from the deity room. So all the time he clack, 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 and those old presses, you know, that sound would be there. But Sasar Tako considered the, this sound to be very pleasing because it's the printing of transcendental literature. So as I was explaining yesterday, Sasar Tako had one room on the roof above above the uh, Dhammachari ashram and you can still see that the bed he used and the shoes, the wooden shoes he used and still preserved them. and there's also a photo which is now in very bad condition of uh, from, the, well, from the time when they moved the deities from the Mended House to the New Marble Temple in Calcutta um, just behind the temple, uh, within the boundary wall of the map land, there was a nice pond, man-made pond. Um, so they use this, they did and still do use this, this pond for uh, washing all the deities, pots, and um, like this, using water for worshipping the deities. Now, uh, people in Bengal and Orissa, as I was explaining, you know, most of them are very fond of eating fish. Unfortunately, but true. So, uh, people used to come and fish in the pond. The Bhakti Sansas were talking, didn't like this at all. He said, you should not take fish from this pond. The pond he said, this is no different from the Yamuna. But there was one man who, anyway, repeatedly came and he was fishing there. Until one day a snake bit him. So, be careful. So, I know we shouldn't perform simple activities, but if you're specifically warned not to by a great saintly person, then uh, we should be especially careful to heed their warning. Similarly, um, in Calcutta once, an advocate came to see Sazwar Talko. And he was smoking cigarettes right in front of him in his very presence. And Sensor Tako requested him not to do so. But anyway, he did. And within a short time, he, uh, he got typhoid or cholera, I can't remember. And then he also died. Not that uh, Bhakti Sensor Tako hated anyone, but Krishna didn't tolerate the offenses against the children of the Many times, uh, people like advocates and professors and highly educated people come to Sarsford Temple. There are various reasons for that. Generally, uh, in India, anyway, people like to come to see Sarsford. Um, another reason was that Sarsford Temple was uh, well known as a great scholar and intellectual himself, and that he spoke very strongly. And uh, the points he made, were not, many of them are not popular when they are accepted. No, no. Uh, for instance, it was known that he was against, or, or, or he, he was not a, a, a favorable towards the Indian independence movement. It was known that he was uh, not in favor of the Ram Krishna mission, which was very highly respected, even though they had flesh eating sannyasis and other various severe discrepancies. Yeah. Even today in Bengal, if you speak against the Ram Krishna mission, you do so at the risk of your life. Of course, with the up with the rise of this one, their influence has gone down a lot. But even in 1970 or 1971, Papa got a letter to Jai Maharaj and said that uh, 
and said these people they are complete rascals, but don't speak publicly against them because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just not the atmosphere to do so. Prabhupada said, he did, uh, Bhaktis Dhamsas didn't openly speak against them, but privately he said that this Ram Krishna guy with his beard, he looks just like a goat, travel Ram Krishna, goat Ram Krishna. <laughs> Another person who was very highly respected in Bengal was Mobi Kado, Mabindu Nath Kado. He's a very, kind of he was a very, was a very uh, highly talented poet. And he even won a Nobel Prize for Literature. So he was very highly regarded and still is today. But Dr. Sensas Rattako used to call all these people Boka, which means fool. So uh, once Ravi Kagawa wrote a series of articles in a newspaper under a pseudonym, the Sasra Tako replied to all his misconceptions, also under a pseudonym. So anyway, many intellectuals used to come to see Sasra Tako, uh, especially when he got that uh, prestigious building at the Bhagavata. And um, many of them came with challenging motive, that they didn't, they, they were not satisfied with, with his, his message. But Sasa Tapo, he would, uh, he would always defeat people in, in discussion, no one could stand before him. Once a group of scholars came to see him, he said, we have many questions to ask him. So Sasa Tapo said, all right. But he said, first you just listen to me. So they agreed. And he spoke for over two hours. And then he said, so what are your questions? <laughs> they didn't want to ask any questions. <laughs> and they could understand that uh, there was no use to challenge him. That his uh, depth of understanding was so far superior to them. That their, their object, they, they could understand. Of course, they might not admit it, but they could understand that uh, their objecting was like a, like a children's objections compared to him. Mm. All right, I mean, I'm, this won't be exactly a linear discussion, but just as ideas coming in, how do I say? Um, once a man came to the Golden Mart and uh, came to join, and usually people who came to join, they were sent to do some minimal service. Especially washing pots, and clean out the cow shed, and so on. Even if they were very highly qualified materially, that was their first service. Sasa Tapa repeatedly emphasized that there is no material qualification for devotional service. And although he mostly preached to the uh, more educated class of people, and uh, some very highly educated people joined him, he always emphasized that. Krishna cannot be understood simply by one's brain power. Atashri Krishna Rama Dina Bhavad Brahim Indriya Seva Mukhe Hi Jiva Do Swabe Espiriti Adaha He would repeatedly uh, quote this verse from Nava Pancharatra. I'll get the translation. So actually he had, he had some very highly educated and uh, brilliant followers, some. Many were also uh, simple, uneducated people who were attracted to the principles of purity which he has found. So I said, anyway, uh, once someone came to join the mat, and he was sent to the kitchen, and uh, after two or three days, the devotees said, you see this man, he's doing such good service. He scrubs the pot so hard, you never saw anyone scrub so hard like that. So, Bhaktisthan Sasvatapa didn't seem very impressed. He said, all right, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see how he does. So, after a few days, um, the man's wife came and took him back home. The body said, you see, he was so enthusiastic, how was he? he just went back so easily. So, Bhaktisthan Sasvatapa explained, he had an argument with his wife. And he wanted his wife to submit to him, but she didn't. So he came and joined the monk, and he was just waiting for his wife to come and say sorry, and then he'd go back. <laughs>
But he was in a very angry mood, so that's why he was scrubbing the pot so much. <laughs> Of course, many young men used to come and join the martyrs, dhammacharis, and uh, often their parents didn't like them. Does that ever happen in Russia? I think it's all over the world since the beginning of time. If a young man wants to be a sadhu, then the mother all of a sudden often develops a very serious disease that can only be cured if her husband comes home, if her son comes home. Or mm. uh, the whole family... Uh, threatens to commit suicide, and so on. These are normal things. So, um, often the families used to come looking for their son. And uh, lots of tears and wailing and bawling and falling on the ground, tearing their hair. I mean, Bengalis are very <laughs> expressive people. Sasha <laughs> Thakur would hide the brahmacharis away. <laughs> and he, he would warn them, don't, don't be moved by the tears of your mother, that is Maya calling. And even the parents would call the police and say, do you know where that boy is? No. <laughs> so Sasha Chaka said, if we didn't do that like this, there would be no glory of up. Because, you know, almost all the parents, they were, you know, on the verge of suicide if the son didn't come back. Of course, in, uh, in all these cases, when the son didn't come back, the, uh, surprisingly, the mother's disease somehow rather became cured anyway. And the families who were all going to commit suicide, they, you know, just when they were going to do it, they decided, no, maybe we shouldn't do it. But Sasa Taka, he commented that even though, uh, sorry, Jody Shekhar will commented that even though Sasa Taka was very strict, he was very kind also. Uh, he says, if he hadn't been, then who could have stayed in the mud? Because uh, most of his followers were Bengalis. And although uh, generally mothers are known to be oceans of kindness, Bengali mothers are especially affectionate, especially towards their sons. Mm-hmm. As Talpat told Kalavishnu Maharaj when he was going to pre- preach in Bangladesh, he said that you should preach with the courage of an Englishman and the heart of a Bengali mother. So, uh, these young men who were joining the mission, they were used to lavish affection and pampering at home. So, if Sasar Thakwa hadn't been very kind, Jati Shaita Prabhu uh, said, then he didn't help anyone to say it. Sasar Thakwa would often go around at night after the brahmacharis had taken rest and he'd see if anyone hadn't put their mosquito on it, he would personally put it for them. There's one devotee, uh, a Sadi Kananda, who didn't like to sleep at night very much. He liked to stay up and chant more and more noms. Um, if you've seen, they have these, in India they have these, these cots like beds and uh, wooden beds, and they have four sticks in the four corners to find the mosquito net. So Sadi Kananda would sit on his cot chanting, and so he wouldn't fall asleep, he had his shooter tied up to the stick. <laughs> so when he started to fall asleep, he said, like this. So Sasa Kako said that actually this is not the process of chanting. He said it's not a mechanical process, it has to come from the heart. Although uh, Swati Kanan, he was much dedicated to, he had a very sincere desire to chant the holy names of the Lord. Um, generally, Sasa Kako, where he's his whole mood was that everyone should be very busy. Um, he wanted everyone to follow sadhana, but he also wanted everyone to be busy in preaching activities. He would have the devotees go, go out early in the morning before people went to work and go door to door for begging. And then he would give some rice, some dal, some vegetables, maybe some monetary contribution. Um, so this he always he always wanted the devotees to be very busy, so he, so he would be preaching and helping others and also not get in Maya. In Oriya language, there is a word matura, which means a lazy person. It means uh, someone who lives in a muck. In other words, because they have no work to do, so they're just lying around doing nothing. So Sasa Kato said, you should not be a matwa. Another word he uses is mak- makanedhi. 
to say a Griya Nevi. So he said you shouldn't be a Maha Nevi. Simply, a Griya Nevi is a materialistic household who is not interested in spiritual life. So he said you should not be a Maha Nevi. Simply living in the mud with no interest in spiritual life. Sometimes uh, he used to say that some of his mats, they were like a kawa dawa dukan, which means uh, like a joint mess. Joint mm-hmm. mess means, uh, just like people that say they come from the village and they're living in the city, mm-hmm. and they all come together and they all cooperatively, they cook together and they eat together, and it's a joint, the yeah, uh, whole activity is just for, they cooperate together for the sake of eating. That's their, that's what a joint mess is. Mm. Mm. Right. Yeah. In one word it's hard to explain. Yeah. You have to give yeah. the whole analogy. <laughs> because it, you know, communism is doing this. So. Mm. And it's part of industrial culture, mm. capitalist culture. Mm. Anyway. The people come from town? To anyway. And he, he lamented that uh, he, he saw that living in a town, they'd get up, sing one or two, have a little arty, sing one or two bhajans, then they'd go and collect some rice and dal, and then they'd cook, and they'd eat, wash the pots, take rest, and then again for the next meal they'd cook and eat and wash the pots, and that was their whole day's activity. Too. So the whole day's activity is centered around uh, eating. Of course, it's a lot of hard work to cook and to clean the pots and you know to eat so much. So plenty of sleeping is also important. So Sarva so Thakur to try to uh, countermand this tendency, he always was pushing everyone to be very busy and preaching. Once he came to the mat in Madras and found that it was in a very bad state of affairs. Everything was very dirty and disheveled. The devotees were all fighting among themselves. There were no preaching activities. So says my Thakur just sent them all home. Oh, you all go home. Then the Dharma turned to go home. He said, you're not fit to live in a man. He just brought new Dharma Chars from different places and started all over again. So it turned out as Swadhikananda, he liked to chant. Practically all day he would chant all those beads here within the Dharma. Or with the Dharma? I don't know. These are singing with the Madonna. Oh. So the devotees, they were complaining to Sarasar Thakur. He's not doing any work. He said, you're always telling us not, not to just sit in the temple and chant, but that's what he does. Sarasar Thakur, he didn't want everyone just to sit in the temple and chant. For two reasons, because he wanted preaching. Another reason that he knew that in the name of sitting and chanting, they would be sitting and snoring. So, in this case, however, Sarasar Thakur said that, uh, well, actually it's very good. And he ordered that an advertisement be put in the newspaper. That everyone is welcome to join the Bolivia. We will provide food, clothing, shelter, all your basic requirements. But you have to try and hurry Krishna, non stop on them. But Sarasar Thakur said, if anyone can actually do it, like Swadhi Kano, that's very good. But no one came from here, from this advertisement. Uh, later, Swati Paman was the well-known Krishna's Babaji Maharaj, who was uh, well-known and a very dear friend of all time, and who was very uh, well-known as being fully absorbed in chanting the holy names all day and night, and was an emblem of humility. If anyone ever came to him with any questions, his reply was, Hare Krishna. So, although in his youth he would tie up his shika to say wait for a champion, by practice he came to the stage where he conquered eating and sleeping and he was chanting, chanting, chanting. Well, everyone knows India is basically, most of the country is pretty hot. Just like Russia is known as a cold country. But just as in Russia, some portion of the year can be quite hot. So similarly in India, in the northern parts, and, uh, in some parts of India, it, at some part of the year it can be quite cold also. So, in Kaka, in the winter, for one or maximum two months, it's quite cold at night. Now, I was telling you that people were coming and fishing uh, even against the, the, the devotee's desire. 
So they had a flower and vegetable garden also. So it was required that uh, someone guard that at night, unless people would come and see all the flowers and vegetables. Yes, even though it was a temple of the Lord, still there were people who had no scruples about stealing from it. So what, what they did, they, they had like a watchman's hut, like a, a small thatch hut just in the, in the garden, keeping guard at night. So there was one Jagannath Brahmachari who used to stay out there at night. And even without warm bedding, he would stay out there in the winter. So he was quite proud of that. But uh, Sarsar Thakur detected this pride in him. And he said that, well, someone else should stay out there now. Sarsar Thakur, and the Jagannath Brahmachari said, no, he said, no, I'm the only one who can stay out in the cold at night. And so I kind of said, no, I'm just going to do it also. I'm not the only one. Um, so I said, Tapo's main uh, center was at uh, Mayapal, Sri Chaitanya Mat. And later the uh, Bhagavad Mat in Calcutta became of uh, equal or in some ways more important. But so I said, Tapo also had many uh, Small maps, several small maps within the whole Maladip Mandal, the area of Maladip. So there was one at uh, Mangachi, which is modern name of the village, which uh, in, was previously known as Vidyanaga, which was the place of Vindavanas Tapa. Now there they had uh, extensive land with gardens and many cows there. So there's a lot of manual labor required. So if any devotee like, committed some bad offense or did something quite wrong that he shouldn't do, he was sent to Mandachi to do a little uh, physical service. So that became known as the jail of the day and night. Um, in, at, at Chaitanya Mark also, the, the, there was some land where they they had uh, vegetables and all this cultivation. But the uh, devotee in charge of organizing the gardening said that well, no one wants to help. See, they're all great sadhus, they're all sitting and chanting on their beads. But no one wants to help grow vegetables to offer to Martha and Krishna. So when Sasa Thakur heard this, he went straight out of the garden and said, tell me what to do, what are you doing? And he started working in the garden. When all the other devotees heard this, they all came out and said, No, no, we don't do, we shall do. And he said, All right, do it then. And he worked for some time himself in the garden along with so many of his disciples. And after that, there was always someone to work in the garden. Who reminds me actually when I went to uh, Gita Nagari, which is a, a farm project Prabhupada started. In America, I saw the same thing, similar thing. I mean, I don't think anyone had refused to work in the garden. And I saw many devotees uh, working in the garden. Among them was Bhakti Chaitanya Maharaj. Now, as I was saying, um, Sasa Thakur used to send devotees out every day for collections. And some of the devotees, they were not just collecting a few potatoes here and there, but they were actually very expert in raising and getting significant contributions. So it came to Sarasar Thakur's notice that some of the sannyasis were boasting and saying that, uh, you see, we're, we're maintaining the whole institution. Sarasar Thakur is dependent upon us. Without, uh, without our help, without our fundraising, none of the many programs could go on. Now, although the Sasa Thakur's rule that everybody, every brahmachari, every sannyasi, except maybe the pujaris, they should go out every day to beg him. He stopped him. Mean, don't go on. He said, for ten days, you all just sit in the mat and you hear and chant. And, so. and he himself went out for collection for one day and then. But during those ten days, so many contributions came to the mat unsolicited. People were bringing cans of ghee and sacks of rice. And so Sir Tato explained that, uh, that the mat is supported 
by Lakshmi Devi. We are allowed to do some service of fundraising or whatever it may be. That's just our, that just Krishna is giving us a chance to serve him. But I think the, uh, Lakshmi, she is the consort of my own. If she is pleased, then she will give everything. We are not the doers. We are not able to do anything. Um, Sanskrit Thakur, he had, um, it's not exactly clear how many, at least 18 and maybe as many as 23 or 24 sannyas disciples. And, um, Sanskrit Thakur was displeased with some of them, because he saw that in some of them there was a tendency to misuse their position, because they were sannyasis, they tended to lord over the devotees and even mistreat them. And although it was natural that uh, sannyasis would be respected by other devotees, they were like, very demanding of that respect. And they were more interested in um, enjoying the facilities of sannyas than leading the life of dedication to preaching that is the meaning of sannyas. Not all sannyasis, but some of them. So Sazar Kapo said, Kolinam Shanyasi Hai Gelo Vilashi. I made them into sannyasis, renunciates, but they have become sense enjoyments. Once there was one Puri Maharaj, I'm not sure which one, um, um, not, it is another Puri Maharaj who long since passed away. So, um, he was doing some collection in Bombay, which is the, I don't know, not then, maybe Calcutta was a rich city, but anyway, Bombay was a rich city. Mm-hmm. So, um, you see, the Chaitanya Mata had been, been constructed, but at that time there was no drinking water facility. The Ganga was there at some distance, now the Ganga is very close, but uh, Ganga water isn't so suitable for drinking on or uh, general usage because it has a lot of mud in it. So they were giving up with the devotees, so they wanted to make the tube and some tube rods. Mm. It means hand pumps. Mm. But these are quite expensive as you have to, you have to bore into the earth. So this Puri Maharaj, he was in the home of a rich merchant. He visited the home of a rich merchant in Bombay. And he was flattering the man's wife. They all were just like Lakshmi and he's flattering her and some of okay. So the uh, people they offer here, here's some food, some food. Who please eat this? People? Yeah, they, they, the man and his the family oh. who was with him. So uh, Sanyasi refused and said, you see, I've come from Mayapur and the bodies are suffering there so much for lack of drinking water. They said, I won't eat anything unless you first pledged to give a donation for six tubers. Now, uh, people think it's very inauspicious if a sadhu comes to their home and you, you know, he doesn't eat anything, you have to feed him something. So they want, the man, the merchant said, well, you eat something first and then we'll discuss what you'll come for afterwards, because he's been understood that sadhu comes with some donation. But he refused and said, you give the donation first and I'll eat afterwards. So the wife of the merchant became very afraid. She said, it's very inauspicious for us if he leaves without eating, so give him what he wants. So even though there's a very large sum of money, the merchant uh, agreed. But when Sasar Kako heard about this, he actually wasn't very pleased. He said, did you speak any Hari Kata to those people? He said, it's not proper that you simply go and ask for some contribution. And you simply flatter them, that's not proper. He said that you should go and speak Hari Kata, and then if they're satisfied with your preaching, so then let them contribute. So there are a few other books, which give some insights into the character of Sasa Taco. I Questions? <laughs> I have a story that once Bhakti Stanta Saraswati of course said that it is not you who eat prasadam, this is prasadam who eats you. Mm-hmm. And it is not you who see the deities, it's uh, these other deities who see you. That's right, you must have seen the notes from my 
It's from the transcription from my book. That's where it came from. Well, actually, um, it's a play on words, which doesn't... It's a play on words. The uh, the word bho, uh, bhoga and bhogya, which means bho, which is that means that which is offered, which becomes prasad after the Lord enjoys it. And bhogya means... Bho means that which is to be enjoyed. That means food which is offered to the Lord. And bhogya means... Um, well, Bhogya means that which is to be enjoyed, and Bhokta, Bhokta means he who is enjoyed. So Sasa Thakur is saying that you are not the, you are not the Bhokta, you are not the enjoyer, you are the Bhogya, you are that which is to be enjoyed. Similarly, he's saying uh, that when we go for Darshan of the Lord, Darshan means see, but he was explaining that we present ourselves before the Lord that he will see us. Not that we go to see him. So it's a matter of consciousness. That I'm presenting myself before the Lord that here I am, I am your servant. Any other questions? Um, what benefits do the parents and devotees uh, attain? Get? What benefit do the parents and devotees get? They get it also benefit. Every time you chant Hare Krishna, your parents benefit. It depends on uh, your level of development and uh, their own attitude will also affect how much they benefit. But definitely all the family members of uh, devotees, they get benefit by that one person's being a devotee. It's said that up to, in Shastra it says that up to 21 generations of, of a pure devotee, uh, pure devotee's family, both ancestors and descendants, they all get liberated. Speak louder. You mentioned in one of the lectures that Krishna and Arjuna were going hunting, mm-hmm. and they were killing animals, mm-hmm. so how should we understand this killing, which is or against religious principles. It's against religious principles? Hmm. Now I'm asking. Hmm. Are you sure? How is it connected with religious principles to kill? Then, uh, killing is not necessarily against religious principles. <laughs> but unnecessary killing is against religious principles. For a key not to Execute a murderer is against religious principles. If you read Krishna book, you'll find the answer to your question. Where it's described there that uh, at another time, Krishna and Arjuna were hunting also. So Prabhupada explains that uh, Kshatriyas, they used to go hunting for various reasons. One reason is they have to practice killing. Because when, the, when it's required, they have to fight in battle and kill enemies. So if they become squeamish at the sight of blood, then how can they fight? So they have to get used to the rather uh, unpleasant matter of killing. Another reason is that uh, the Rishis, they live in the forest, and therefore to reduce the population of dangerous animals in the forest, Shatriyas go hunting in the forest. Another reason is that the animals that are killed uh, may be offered in sacrifice. So it's not nice. Killing is not nice. But as uh, Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita, there is fault in every kind of activity. In every activity there is some kind of fault, but it should not be given up for that reason. So Prabhupada explains in the Prabhupada that um, Kshatriyas, they have to kill, Vaishyas, they may have to um, seek some lies in the matter of business transactions. And even Brahmanas may be involved in uh, offering sacrifice of animals. So there's no way to avoid some nastiness in this material world. But one should not give up one's prescribed duties because they are nasty. All right, Hare Krishna, we finished that. Yes.
Well, maybe next year I'll do a question and answer session. But we have to pull up another seminar.